Okay, it's a given Thursday. This is Jay Fidel and ThinkTech, and we have Tom Yamachika here on Talking Tax with Tom on a given Thursday. Uh, welcome to the show, Tom. Thanks for having me here, Jay. Good to be back. Tom Yamachika is president of the Tax Foundation of Hawaii, and of course, we're going to talk about tax and, and fiscal policy. So since we spoke last time, the Council on Revenues issued a report. Can you talk about it? Well, the, uh, uh, the report was rather grim. Um, it uh, revised somewhat uh, downward the revenue that they were anticipating for the year. So we now have a budget hole of, I think, $2.3 billion. Uh, and lawmakers have to uh, deal with that somehow because they are required to pass a balanced budget. $2.3 billion is, is a substantial percentage of the total uh, state uh, um, budget, isn't it? It's like twenty percent of the state budget. Yeah, the whole the whole budget, top to bottom, is I think fourteen billion. Uh, the GE tax gives us maybe six billion. Uh, all the other taxes combined give us maybe uh, I don't know four or five, and um, uh, then we rely on you know like federal grants and. Uh, you know, other uh, largest from the federal government, as well as, you know, to a lesser extent, user fees and other uh, other charges for government services. And it but, all adds up to give us a, a balanced budget consistent with the limitation in the state constitution. But um, the federal government part, um, haven't the Republicans said, Mitch McConnell, that they're not going to entertain any more money, uh, either to individuals and certainly not to the states? Well, they're uh, they're working with that right now. The um, I, I believe the Senate just passed a what is it a clarification bill uh, dealing with uh, various pieces of uh, PPP and the other programs that were uh, already enacted. Uh, I think it broadens them a little bit. Uh, House and Senate have passed those. It's going to go on Trump's desk, and he's expected to sign it. So, so there will be something. Uh, I'm not sure what, but there, there's going to be something. But it's uh, not going to be two know. billion dollars. It's not going to. No, I don't. Not going to cover the puka here. Yeah. No, 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 not not at all. And uh, what? And one thing you got to realize is that uh, because the rest of the the country is recovering faster than we are. Um. And we have so much problems here, like with getting people their unemployment checks, uh, we are going to have people moving away. Uh, matter of fact, a couple of days ago, uh, the University of Hawaii Economic Research Organization's executive director, a gentleman named Carl Bonham, he told the, uh, the House Select Committee that uh, they're expecting an out-migration of 30,000 people uh, over the next two years. And if things get really bad, it, the, the pessimistic scenario is that you lose thirty thousand people in one year. So yeah, that, and that has a, a an echo effect. If you keep on talking about people leaving the state, then other people who might not have entertained that idea uh, will start thinking also about leaving the state, and then you get more than thirty thousand. And the worse the economy gets, the more people will do that. So then you shrink the tax base, don't you? Yeah, with fewer people and the same amount of uh, government expenses, uh, there's going to be a bigger burden per you know <laughs> per person left. So, yeah. uh, so the, then the question becomes: Well, what is uh, you know what, what is the party in our, uh, in our in our big square building going to do about it? Well, one possibility we we should not forget this is. Uh, Gee, let's let's examine this. This is like energy efficiency. Before you generate more energy, then you think about how you can be more efficient in using it and use less. So, what about cutting state expenses? I mean, people have been talking about how bloated the budget is for years. Um, why doesn't the why doesn't the legislature just cut expenses? Well, I think the primary reason is that the unions are having none of it. Uh, Corey Rosenley already came out with an op-ed in Civil Beat saying, you know, uh, shared sacrifices for the birds. 
Um, we have uh, UPW's Gary Rodriguez uh, coming out and opposing any uh, form of uh, cuts for his members um, and, and basically saying we're not going to cooperate in anything that you guys do, uh, specifically with reference to, you know, moving people around to, uh, uh, you know, from, from, for, for people who otherwise aren't working and are getting paid for doing nothing and repurposing them to do something else. Uh, and then, and then uh, what I hear is HGEA uh, is saying, well, not only are you, are you going to not furlough us, but you are going to put in place the, the raises that were in the collective bargaining agreement. Oh, no. Oh, my goodness, Chris. Which, which is another $60 million. Oh, no. <laughs> um, and, you know, my, my question is, you know, uh, with, with our tax base going down, with our economy in the tank, uh, how can we afford this? What are you going to do? Uh, if if there are no low-hanging fruits, like, you know, you, you, you find people who haven't paid tax for 20 years and, and, and go, you know, haul them and shake them dry, uh, if you can't find, uh, you know, people or companies like that, what are you going to do? Well, um, you know, just, just to go on the track about reducing expenses for a minute, uh, other states have reduced the retirement system payout. Um, we really don't have the money uh, to, con you know, contribute uh, what the rules require. We, in fact, we're we're late. We're in default. The state is in default of contributing billions to the employee's retirement system. We can't afford that. And frankly, uh, you know, I, I don't think it's efficient anyway. Those benefits are too rich. And although at one time in a, in a, in a time of um, prosperity might have been appropriate to just leave them alone, we're not in prosperity and the unions can't take this position. And I guess I would ask you, what happens um, if we just respect the unions and we keep on funding in and out of the state employees retirement system and we give them raises uh, in a time of crisis and we, and we uh, have all these people working or rather being paid without working and we don't want to repurpose them. You know, by the way, there was a thing about Keith Kaneshiro, uh, not that he's directly involved with the unions, but Keith Kaneshiro has been at home, um, you know, the former prosecuting attorney, getting paid his full salary for a year, um, a year now. And that's bloat. Somebody should have said no. Um, in any event, we have all these expenses going out. Unions won't tolerate any change. What's the ultimate, you know, people leaving the state, spiraling the whole fiscal, you know, enterprise down? What happens at the end of the day with that? Well, I think a better question is what's going to happen come November? Um, <laughs> okay. is, is there going to be any change? Uh, one One way that uh, that that the people can affect change uh, is at the ballot box. Uh, if you think the you know the person uh, who is now representing you isn't doing a great job, uh, go go elect somebody else, uh, and hopefully that person does better. Um, We're not voting for a new governor in November. We're voting for what city council and a bunch of legislators. Am I right? Uh, and mayor. Mayor of Honolulu, a bunch of legislators, uh, mm. all all the House members and half the Senate. Yeah. Okay. You know. You know. It's funny though, Tom. Uh, let me throw this at you. Um, I can't remember a a given candidate. Maybe you can, who made it his primary plank uh, to uh, be more efficient. That is austerity. That is cut government spending. So we didn't have pukas the size of two billion dollars. Um, do you think that the people running for office are going to adopt that kind of platform now? Because if they all adopt the platform and we the voters vote for people who are um, uh, advocating for austerity seriously, that might help. Well, it might or might not. I mean, uh, uh, it, it turns out that when people actually get into office and, and they are confronted with hard reality, uh, you know, stuff changes. Yeah, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't argue with that. Not only did this stuff change about this platform point, but any platform point. 
uh, hard reality being political hard reality. <laughs> it's, not, it's not necessarily a good thing. So, okay, so $2 billion um, and no other choice and uh, the unions uh, hanging tough and ERS costing us a fortune and- um, uh, And being constitutionally gonna... protected, by the way. Yeah, well, and they're not gonna agree to any changes. So we got a problem, Pro Dallas, Houston, whatnot. Um, so what that means, uh, increased taxation, because what else can the legislature do? Um, I think they're, they're limited from borrowing money. They're not going to get money from the Fed. Um, what can they do but raise taxes or try? Well, I mean, there are some short-term fixes like, um, uh, you know, trying to figure out what's all, you know, all these special funds that are floating around. And, and there's lots of money floating around. $2 billion? Uh, probably close to it. Mm. Yeah. I mean, there, there are millions and millions of dollars floating around in, in special funds. Not all of them can be repurposed, but, you know, maybe, you know, the better part of a billion dollars can. Uh, and then we really need to seriously think about how, what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. Uh, then uh, I think there does have to be some shared sacrifice on the part of the unions. Uh, I, I don't think it's really realistic for them to be insisting upon, you know, no damage and raises. Uh, while their constituents, um, namely, you know, taxpayers like us, uh, either have no income uh, or are laid off, and you know, we and we couldn't uh, make money if we tried. That's true. That's true. I mean, if you decided you wanted to go out into a, um, a non-economy and try to make some money, oh ho. It's very hard to do that. What are you going to do? Set up a website in your in your living room? I mean, there's nothing to do. There's, there's no business out there. Nobody can pay your bills. The economy is flat. Oh, well, worse than flat. It's 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 going in the tank. Um, and if we don't do something about it, uh, it's 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 like it's like this whirlpool. You know, we're kind of at the edges right now, and it's we're spinning around and going down. And if, and if something doesn't stop the spinning, uh, you know, we're going to get suck in, sucked in. You know, why, why is that reminiscent of a toilet? You know, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, but the ledge has to do something. Um, give me the schedule of the ledge. Right now it's in recess yet again. My recollection is they wanted, they wanted to go into, re they had been in recess most of the spring. Uh, because of COVID, although the, they were one of very few legislatures that actually did that. Um, now they're back, but then they left again, um, and they're in recess now for a week or two. Um, I'm not sure why. Um, and they, they're they going to come back and presumably do something. What is the schedule? Usually by middle of May, they're done. It's way past the middle of May. That's right. They got some, uh, obviously they have some measures to finish up. Um, the, uh, they, they got to polish off the budget. They have to, uh, you know, do other things. And, and I think they are, um, uh, making allowances for taking up measures that we haven't seen before, uh, to do revenue enhancement or, you know, something similar. That means tax increases, right? It may be. What know. about what about money bills? You know, everybody always vibrates when you say money bills, and it goes to the money committees in the House and the Senate. Are they actually going to spend money? Uh, well, they haven't yet. Uh, I mean, they've they've allocated some of the of the federal uh, money that we did get under the CARES Act. Uh, a lot of it went to the counties, um, and you know, maybe half of it. Uh, got stashed into the rainy day fund so we can kind of go back and think about it and figure out what to do when the legislature comes back into session. Yeah, the let's talk point. about the rainy day fund because the people who are listening today might not have heard our discussion on that before. The rainy day fund has got a, what, 150 million or something like that. And it was stashed uh, to keep it away from the governor. That's my understanding. Yeah, now it has um, like a s seven or 800 million. Because oh. because six hundred and eighty, I believe, came from uh, 
or, or, or will come from the federal money. So that's a, that's a substantial piece of change and goes a, a far distance to dealing with our uh, shortfall. Um, but um, if it's in the rainy day fund, there's a question, there's a legal question, right? Whether it should have been put in there because it has to be spent by the end of the year. And if it's not spent by the end of the year, it, it somehow evaporates. Right. The, one of the conditions that the feds put on the money that they, they gave us is that we spend it before the end of the year. So if we don't, uh, it goes poof. They can do that. Yeah, so right now we're at risk of that because the money, I didn't realize it was that much, is still in the rainy day fund as we speak. And it needs some kind of action to get it out of there, out of harm's way, so to say, uh, and start using it for the, you know dealing with the shortfall. What action yeah. does it require? Uh, the legislature has to appropriate it. So w when they get back in on June fifteenth or whenever it is, they're going to start talking about how to uh, how to how to spend that money, uh, so it can do the most good, or or at least supposedly, um, which 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 may mean uh, uh, you know shoring up the uh, uh, you know the public worker unions and and paying them their pay increases. Oh, no if they, if they have their way. They have their way, but boy, that will that would show that the, the unions are way too strong in the state um, to uh, you know ignore the crisis and just take take whatever they can take. Uh, they really should cooperate in, a, in a, 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 some kind of combined effort to deal with the crisis. We are certainly not out of the crisis. We're not out of the crisis in terms of uh, you know COVID, because every time we take a tourist in, we take a risk, and we're certainly not out of out of the crisis in terms of the. The, the you know the reopening because the, yeah well, we, we we're not we're not reopened uh, yeah you know you, you, and you have to consider uh, when you're going to reopen the economy to tourists you, you got to give the tourists time to plan and you got to give our businesses time to ramp up it, it, you know it's it's not going to be like hey if we say you know tomorrow all the tourists can come back in um, that we'll all be ready the, the next day it's, it doesn't happen that way okay. Um, People who are taking vacations need time to plan them. Uh, they, uh, they they need to buy their airline tickets. They need to arrange for the time off from work. You know, at wherever they are now, uh, they they may need to arrange for uh, visas and, and and things like that. They have to obviously book the transportation. Uh, they have to figure what they're going to do when when they're here. Uh, uh, Hopefully, a 14-day quarantine is not going to be part of that because that's going to be, um, you know, 14 days they pay for and they can't do anything. Yeah, and, and then if you have it and don't enforce it, we look silly, which is what we looked like before. We had it, we have it now, and we don't enforce it. Once in a while, there's an arrest report in the newspaper or a fine, but that doesn't convince me that most tourists uh, who are theoretically subject to the quarantine are abiding by it. But the other thing, that, though, and I, I and I really like your thoughts on this, is that, you know, this is not a bubble machine that is standing in the wings waiting to do business with tourists who would come, you know, as soon as they could, because it, it's a it's a wasting asset. Uh, you know, the, if the if the store stopped doing business, it might have gone off the side. It might have lost all its staff. It might have lost its inventory, its supply lines. Um, it, it might not have been able to pay taxes or the rent. It might be out of, completely out of business. So yeah, if you we think have, we have several all, retail all stores and on, restaurants yeah, yeah. And, and all that kind of stuff that, that have already permanently closed. Yeah. So that some entrepreneurs and some banks would have to come in and reestablish that part of the economy. And that's not overnight. And not only that, but it's not clear there are entrepreneurs and there are banks uh, that would belly up to that task and, and start the stores and restaurants again because there's and, so much And it's not just the entrepreneurs, it's the big chains too. Yes, thank you. Yeah. This is a risky business. Why put capital into a risky business? Go somewhere else where the economy is really reopening. Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. Wall Street, uh, Wall Street probably has some reluctance about us. And this, by the way, Tom, on top of the fact that Hawaii has a huge reputation for being a place that's hard to do business, 
a huge reputation for overregulating uh, and, and uh, taking huge delays on permitting and the like. Um, so it's, it's not as if Wall Street and other entrepreneurs in the mainland or other chains from the mainland are gonna rush in. Uh, they may just you know, write it off. They may write us off. And if that's the case, uh, we have a, a, just a, a fraction of what we had before in terms of all those accessory businesses around tourism. That's absolutely correct. I mean, uh, in order to show that that we're ready to be uh, open for business again, we've got to do something about the regulatory pipeline. We got to do something about um, you know the delays uh, in in getting government services or even requiring government services in the first place. I mean, we regulate uh, so many professions, uh, even things that people don't normally think of as professions. We regulate them. Mm. Um, and and the result is you know staggering uh you know user you know user fees quote unquote and governmental delays uh and for what purpose yeah and well yeah. and taxes uh, regressive taxes like the gross excise tax on everything you know they've been talking about relief from that I and mean, you've been you've been observing that at least and speaking on it for years um but we haven't had any relief on the gross excise tax um, and that's a real burden on small business. It's a burden on the customer as well. So, um, you know, what we have here is um, a pretty, a pretty drear picture of trying to reopen, trying to, trying to go forward on it. And I, you know, yeah, it, I think instead know, it's a time of thinking for about... a leader, time for a leader, don't you think, to stand up and say, okay, we have to be business friendly. Um, we have to do everything in our power to restore uh, Wall Street and, and mainland confidence uh, and the confidence of prospective tourists in our in our business community and in our hotel industry and so forth. But we don't hear that, do we? Uh, no, we don't. I mean, I think that's it's it's critical for for us to concentrate on uh, what is going to get our economic engine running again. We we have to realize that if government is going to run. Uh, it needs to run because it's being fed by the economy, not the other way around. Yeah. I mean, they, could th they, they think they can take what they want to, uh, but, but the grim reality is, uh, you, know, if we don't have the, you know, if we don't have the money to pay them taxes, uh, that money isn't coming in. Yeah, this is serious and has serious implications. But there's really nobody speaking on it. Now, again, going back to the platforms of the people who are running for office, I, I wonder if their heads are in the right place. I wonder if the, what do you want to call it, the um, public interest groups are going to impose on them uh, to make reopening and the detail of reopening and a new a reinvention of Hawaii as a place to do business uh, are going to make that an important plank for them. Uh, even even understanding that when they get into office, they may not abide by that plank. It seems to me that's our saving grace right there. That's the biggest, most important, most immediate thing that we can do. Right. I mean, we we need to start, you know, thinking in the right direction. If if the uh, if, if our current leadership doesn't, uh, we need we need to uh, figure out what the candidates are thinking, and. Uh, and, and you look for look for candidates who are going to uh, lead us or lead us, period, but lead us in the right direction. Yeah. Well, okay. Like we got to get them to adopt planks like that and understand it. I mean, I, I can I can visualize a lot of these candidates as not understanding it, not adopting planks. What about the federal delegation? Can they do anything for us at this moment of crisis? Uh, they have been trying, I'm sure. Um, but, uh, you know, Washington has its own problems, as you know, uh, there's a lot of gridlock over there. There, there's, uh, you know, there's not as much collegiality as there was when, you know, when I was in high school, say, uh, and, and, and now each of the politicians, you know, openly calls the other party, the enemy, you know, it's, it's just, it's just amazing. And our president says or retweets that uh, uh, a, a good Democrat is a dead Democrat. That, that was that was really remarkable a few days ago. Well, to say nothing of the fact that the country itself is in dire straits. 
uh, you know, you say we have a reopening on the mainland. I'm, I'm not so sure. Um, this, this uh, you know, nationwide protest is probably getting in the way of a reopening. It's, it's creating, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure we're going to see more of this. It's creating more disease, more infection. Um, and that, in turn, will create the need to close down again. Or at yeah, least, but at uh, least at least the mainland they have uh, they have manufacturing, they have agriculture. You know, they can they can create their own goods. They can uh, they can uh, process food. Uh, we have to import most of that stuff mm. because we have you know some capability of manufacturing, which is very very small, and some some food capability, but it's also very very small. Yeah, we've been trying to do entrepreneurial encouragement for 20 years, actually more like 40, uh, and we have not succeeded in that regard. Uh, most, most of the capital, most of the new businesses are created, as you mentioned, uh, by, by chains or have been created by chains from the mainland, and the mom and pops are really not active. You know, later today, uh, we're going to have Chinoa Fonsworth uh, from Blue Planet. She's going to come on the show. And she can talk about diversification of the economy. I mean, it's, a, it's an appropriate time for that, don't you think? But, you know, the cost of diversification, it, it's not like you snap your fingers and all of a sudden you have a diversified economy. It's harder in a crisis, don't you think? A crisis makes you think you should do it, but it's harder in a crisis. Don't you agree? Yeah, because a, a lot of times uh, your economic diversification also requires setting up infrastructure like supply chains. Um, you know, uh, manufacturing businesses don't exist in a vacuum. Uh, they, they need, um, you know, parts to manufacture their stuff with. Uh, if you're in a, a tech business, you, you still need parts and equipment uh, along with, uh, you know, other supplies. Uh, you, you, you may know more about this than I do. Um, in, in an agricultural business, you need your feed, you need your, uh, your, your, your fertilizers, you need your, uh, your gross product, you need your you know, her herbicides maybe, or, or some, some means of you know, controlling pests and predators uh, so, so they don't eat your food before you do. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, each one of those things requires an investment of money. You know, you want to talk about supply chains and um, inventory and uh, marketing and, uh, and restaurants to buy those things or other businesses, customers to buy those things. You know, you have to, you, you, everybody needs money. So it's very hard to spiral it up again to actually reopen. And it's like question economically is where, where do you start? You have to find places where starting gives you the, the best leverage. And, and I suggest, Tom, that nobody's thinking about this. Um, DBED's not thinking about it. The government, the state government, are not thinking about it. I don't know if the legislature has thought about it, but you have to you have to put it in a certain place. You have to incentivize it. You have to you have to get people off the dime. Otherwise, um, you know, it's going to be organic, and I don't think we want organic now because organic will take a hundred years. Um, we, we, what's, what do we do? We're we're out of time here today, Tom. Uh, can we sort of um, assimilate all these thoughts? And what's your advice? I, I, I'm making you consigliere to the entire state. What's our, what do you do? Well, we have to figure out some way of, of getting the economy running again. Uh, we need a, a, a definite reopening plan, um, you know, s subject to revision only in the most dire circumstances. So we need to have something that businesses can rely on, that people can rely on, that, that prospective tourists can rely on. Uh, so they'll, you know, at least come back here and, 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 and our business people uh, can know the, you know, they, they at least have a market coming. Okay. I feel certain we're going to talk about this again. In fact, let me put it another way. It's absolutely essential that we talk about this again. Um, this is the biggest problem the state has seen in our lifetime. Uh, anyway, thank you very much, Tom. Tom Yamachika, President of Tax Foundation of Hawaii, uh, looking out for our fiscal future. Thanks so much. And thank you for having me on the show. Aloha.